Hello, this is Alan Cozen welcoming you to another installment of Things We Said Today, our weekly Beatles podcast about all things to do with the Beatles, solo and group, past, present, and future, if we can find out about it. And I'm joined by my three co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, whose work you know from the internet as the Beatles examiner and the writer of several other examiner columns. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Right. And Al Sussman, a longtime contributor and executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine. Hello, Al. How's it going? Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. And this week, we're we're going to begin with a bit of actual news just occurred today uh, as we record this anyway uh, which is the passing of Robert Stigwood um, who had a brief but important Beatles connection uh, in his partnership with Brian Epstein for a while and uh, apart from just a, a very significant musical career or management music management career um, Steve do you want to give us some of the details about that well the the connection with the Beatles is rather thin because he had tried to he and Brian Epstein had talked about a partnership that never happened. But what uh, what he did do uh, there's two things. Number one, he was longtime manager for the Bee Gees, which uh, which were a big competition for the Beatles, um, and. The Bee Gees actually did a number of Beatles songs on their own um, live. Uh, there are all sorts of, if you look on YouTube, there are several, there are several, several instances where they sang Beatles songs. And in fact, I wrote a story about that a few years ago. And and uh, the other thing, and I know this is going to probably start a debate among you guys, but he was also responsible for the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band movie, which a lot of people can't stand. I'm not one of those people. Um, I actually thought parts of Sgt. Pepper were pretty good um, musically. I, the 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 story of the movie is horrible, but the the music in the movie is is actually pretty good. And uh, they do. And uh, of course, he had all that. Uh, he had all those uh, Beatle connections. Uh, um, uh, Billy Preston was in it. Um, uh, uh, George Martin, I believe, produced that album. Did he not? Mm -hmm. uh, there were all sorts of, you know, Beatle connections to that movie, uh, and the the movie got Peter Frampton. Peter Frampton. Peter Frampton. Oh, yeah, was Peter in? Frampton was in it, of course. Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, there a lot of it's gotten a lot of critical bashing. I don't honestly think it's that bad. The m music, I think, is actually. So it's a good soundtrack album and a horrible movie is basically right. what you're saying. Mm, yeah. Right. Steve, yeah. didn't didn't uh, Stigwood and Brian work together for most of a year at some point on on presentations? W w am I wrong about that? I was looking. I was looking, uh, doing some uh, looking around, and what I saw said n no that they had that they had uh, uh, done some that they had considered around the time um, that Brian died of getting together, and it and it never happened. Let me well, see. Uh, Actually, in January of '67, they did enter a uh, you know kind of a tenuous partnership of Nems Enterprises and Stigwood's uh, Stigwood's group at that point, and it lasted for about mm -hmm. about nine months until Brian died, mm -hmm. and then after that, when uh, and and in, and in fact there was there was talk. Of uh, of possibly of Brian, you know, because at that point he was having some personal problems and et cetera, et cetera, and there was talk that uh, that Brian might even let uh, let Stigwood take over the management of the group, which the group absolutely was one hundred percent totally against. Mm -hmm. But then when after Brian died. And the family, the Epstein family, uh, installed Clive, uh, Brian's brother, as the you know head of NEMS. That was you know that pretty much you know sealed Stigwood's 
doom as far as you know involvement with uh, uh, with NEMS, and he he just moved on and formed his you know the Robert Stigwood organization, but, you know RSO, which became you know his his big production management group. Right, right. But Saturday they, night, Saturday yeah. night fever, and right. all that. Stuff. Yeah, but there, Greece, <clears throat> right? You know. But there mm-hmm. was, uh, there was a, you know, there was at least a, a semi-official kind of merger that went on for about for about nine months there in mm. in sixty seven. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know that it, it wasn't really in terms of Beatle history. It wasn't really that significant, though. I don't. I really don't think. I mean. Well, it did bring, for instance, the well, the Bee Gees and Cream into the into the Nems family for those for those few months. And in fact, it was through through the you know connections with Murray the K that uh, that the Bee Gees and Cream and the Who as well ended up uh, being in one of those one of the last of those Murray the K multi multi-act uh multi-day shows that he did at uh various theaters he used to do them at the brooklyn fox theater and i think this one was at the rko theater in uh in manhattan uh in uh the spring of 67 and uh you know and that was basically through the connections that murray had with with brian and them's and by extension, Stigwood. Mm-hmm. Also, didn't Stigwood pretty much kind of guide or manage Eric Clapton from, say, yes. Cream through all the different yeah. bands and Blind Faith and mm. Derek and the Dominoes and the solo career and all that? So he played a big part yeah, with Eric's absolutely career. absolutely he did. Mm. And then he also played a big part in musicals, too. And as we had just uh, mentioned, Andrew Lloyd yes. Webber... Uh, you know, musicals like Jesus Christ Superstar and um, and Evita, I think. Yes, he worked mm-hmm. on too. So, yeah, he's had a he had a very impressive career, no doubt about it. And just thinking about all the the records on RSO, it's it's uh, mm-hmm. you know he's left behind a lot, you know, a great legacy right there. This link I'm looking at here says he was also involved with John Paul, George, Ringo, and Bert. Right, um, which was which was a Broadway show, or off, right. uh, or well, really off Broadway, barely off Broadway show, uh, that was done at the Beacon, if I remember correctly, um, in '74, which kind of set the template for the Sgt. Pepper movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was uh, that didn't. Yeah, that didn't last very long. No, but although uh, John Lennon actually did a little bit of promotion for that um, in, um, I think it was October of 74, during the period when he was promoting Walls and Bridges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Okay. okay. So, farewell, Robert Stigwood. In discussing what would be the uh, main part of the show this week, we were um, kicking around the idea of choosing a solo album, which was Ken's idea, and then he kicked that into my court, and I had to pick the solo album. Um, and so <laughs> so I chose um, George's Gontrapo, just because I think it is one of those great underrated Beatles solo albums, which I, I guess you could say for a lot of George's and Ringo's albums. Um, well, you could probably say it for a lot of Paul's albums, too. But no one ever talks about Gontropo. I don't know that anyone bought it, you know? I mean, I I came a little bit late to a lot of the solo stuff. I was mainly a group guy, and it was really only when... Um, you know, I, I I had paid some attention to the early part of George's career. I went to the concert for Bangladesh and then just sort of tuned out for a bit and caught up a bit later in the 80s. And as I was sort of going around picking up the various things that I missed, Gontrapo, I mean, I don't remember hearing all that much about it when it was out. It pretty much disappeared. And I bought it, took it home, played it. And I thought, you know, this is a really nice album. Mm-hmm. Um, there is some great mm-hmm. stuff on it. And 
all told, it's just a, it's a very pleasant listen. And, uh, you know, it's George. Uh, it was basically the almost the last we heard from George until Cloud Nine. So it was mm-hmm. like a, a five year gap. Um, there were some other things. Um, there was the I don't want to do it from Porky's Revenge. Right. And, Blue suede shoes. The Carl Perkins. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and a Princess Trust appearance. And it, but you know we hadn't. He he was really laying low during that period. So Gontrapa was the impression I got. I could be wrong. You, you guys feel free to correct me, which I, I know you will. My feeling about that was sort of as if it was as if he just sort of threw up his hands in disgust and said, "Okay, you know, why should I keep putting these things out?" You know. But it's it's really a lovely album, and uh, I thought maybe we, we'll we'll go around and start with um, Steve. I'm not saying that we all necessarily <laughs> agree that it's a, a lovely album, so uh, I'm sure we'll get some diversity of opinion here. Yes, you will, um, because I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Did, oh God, Gone Trapo is just one of those albums that I never really. I, I mean, I love George. Uh, George's, you know, um, George's albums have always been very special to me. But Gontrapa is one of the few Beatles. Well, is one of one of his albums that I just never got into. I just never thought it was. Uh, it just never did much for me. Um, I do like "Wake Up, My Love," and that's the way it goes. The first few songs I, I really like. Um, Gontrapa sounds. The title song itself just sounds kind of. Oh gosh, I don't know how to—I don't know how to put it. It just sounds like he's—he's—he's he's, he's basically. You were talking about throwing up your hands, Alan. It's like he—you know—he was just kind of going, "Well, whatever goes, goes." And and so you know, I—I uh, I did, you know, mystical one. I I do like. In fact, on the on the remastered CD, there's an outtake that's actually pretty nice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, but uh, there, uh, Gontrapo just is not. A grabber, as far as I'm concerned, is it, it? It it's not one of my favorite George albums. I don't know what to. The songs just didn't hook me that much. What can I say? Okay, okay. Mm. The looked for diversity of opinion has turned up <laughs> right at the start, <laughs> as I suspected it might. Oh, um, thank you, <laughs> uh, Ken. Now to have the exact opposite opinion of Steve. Mm. Uh oh. Also, no, also I think that Gontrapo, <laughs> Gontrapo to me is one of the most underrated of George's albums. And like you were saying, Alan, there's a lot of underrated solo Beatle albums, actually from all four Beatles. But um, Gontrapo, I think, is, um, like you said, a very pleasant listen. I happen to like all the songs on there. I think they're very catchy. And the ones that aren't as catchy take a while to grow on you. But when they do, they really hook you in, at least for me anyway. Sometimes I like to think of this album as being similar to the George Harrison album of 1979 Mm -hmm. in that it's a very laid back album. You know, you get the feeling that George is in Hawaii or, you know, on a tropical island and he's relaxing and these are the songs that came out of him. The reason why, well, radio was gradually abandoning George George's music. I mean, somewhere in England, the previous album, despite the fact that it had a number two hit with all those years ago, and that being a huge hit because it was a tribute to John, as well as being a great song to me, it still didn't do that well as an album. Mm -hmm. It only went to number 11 on the charts. And I think that George was really disgusted with the music industry at the time. And this was the last of his albums to fulfill a contractual obligation. And he really didn't want to do any promotion behind it. And in fact, he didn't do any. And unless you were a reader of, say, Beatle Fan Magazine, (laughs) you wouldn't have known that this album had even come out. Mm -hmm. I worked at a record store at the time, and I was surprised when I saw it being put on the shelves. I didn't even know that it was about to be released. Mm -hmm. So George did nothing to promote it. And still to this day, because I always reference George's book, I Me Mine, to find out information about the songs... Uh, that he wrote that book only took you through 1979 you don't know too much about these songs as far as you know why george wrote them Mm -hmm. but the songs are really strong and you know in particular i love mystical one Mm -hmm. i really think that it's a very commercial song and the production on that song as well as the whole album 
is just wonderful. I love the use of the mandolin in particular on Mystical One, which is played by Joe Brown, who's been a, you know, a longtime friend of George's mm-hmm. who lived close by and was a, you know, a British star from the early 60s on up. The Beatles covered A Picture of You, uh, one of his songs that was a hit over there. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the songs one by one are very strong. They're all produced extremely well. That's one thing about George's albums as a solo artist. I think they're all produced so well. And in particular, once it was on his own label, Dark Horse, I think the the production on his albums were much crisper. And you could actually hear the instrumentation much more defined. And the playing on here, he always has great musicians. (laughs) There's no doubt about it on all of his albums. And they really shine on all of his albums. And in particular, because I love the production, I love the production on this album. You know, you really hear some of the great playing Mm -hmm. throughout. Um, In particular, Henry Spinetti, who's the the younger brother of Victor Spinetti, does great uh, drumming throughout this album. Uh, Just listen to the beginning of the drums on That's the Way It Goes, the full sound Mm. of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that. Uh, And Herbie Flowers, the bassist. Right. uh, Billy Preston on Circles. Jim Keltner. Oh yeah, there's right. He, he he he's assembled a really good bunch of people here, as you say. I think yeah. you know you mentioned yeah. Mystical One, and you know the the other striking thing about that you talked about the production is that you know you look at the first verse. They say I'm not what I used to be. All the same, I'm happier than a willow tree. It it, it seems a little bit like he's also responding to, you know, what people are the way people are ignoring him in a way. You know. Hmm. Yeah, well, he's content with who he is, and one of the things that I kind of noticed, and I've said this before in various shows, I think at the very beginning of George's solo career, I think it mattered a lot to him whether or not his music sold well and that he was recognized. And I think once he had that initial success with All Things Must Pass and then the concert for Bangladesh, Mm -hmm. and even you know, Living in the Material World was a number one album, he still had top ten albums through Extra Texture, Mm -hmm. You know, I think he didn't feel as much of a need to prove himself. So he started to put out music that pleased himself first, more so than whether or not it sold. Which is not to say that he didn't put out commercial music. Like 33 and a Third, we've talked about, has some really catchy songs on there, like Cracker Box Palace and, and this song. And he had a great sense of humor when he made that album. But gradually, as time went on, he was putting out music that I think was made to please himself first, more so than whether or not it sold. Not that he didn't care at all whether it sold or not, but I think he was pretty disgusted with the music industry and the changes that were happening in the early 80s. And I don't know if it really upset him that Somewhere in England didn't do as well as it did. We also know that initially with Somewhere in England, he had four different songs that he wanted in the album that Warner Brothers rejected. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that didn't make him very happy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for all these reasons, George did nothing nothing to promote this album and um it's a shame because song for song i really think it's a solid album and in particular i like when when you hear something different from an artist baby don't run away is a song that has stood out for me in a way because you have this really low harmony vocal which apparently based on the 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 credits on the album was billy preston Mm -hmm. And he's also got this woman on there, Rodina Sloan, who does the female vocal. And I like the sound of George singing with a female, <laughs> which you don't hear all that often. Sure. I mean, it happened, it happened later on with Shanghai Surprise mm-hmm. when George sang that with Vicky Brown. But I really like that approach. And, um, you know, Dream Away, mm-hmm. a lot of people thought that had commercial appeal. It first appeared in Time Bandits. And really? it was really, that's a catchy song right there. Yeah. And Circles has emerged for me as one of my all-time favorite George Harrison songs. Mm-hmm. And we all know that it, it, you know, it originated during the White Album, and they made a demo for that. And um, you know, it's a very philosophical song mm-hmm. with very powerful lyrics in there. I love It's all about the changes in life, that everything goes in circles. And you know, certain lines like, dislike someone who will not bend... Later, they may become your best friend. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we've all gone through experiences like that. And yet, as we've said here on this show, you know, the Beatles, back in the days, you know, when they were very young in the group, they put out songs. They wrote songs that 
were so mature <laughs> for their age. Like, you know, Paul writing yesterday or John writing in my life or George writing within you without mm-hmm. you at the age of, what was that, 23 mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> or 24. Here's somebody writing circles, and it was 1968, so George was 25, writing lyrics like this. Mm-hmm. How does he know all this about life? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, all these the philosophical words that are in that song. I love circles, and I love the use of the slide guitar, which he's always been great at. Some really nice slide guitar work in that song, and, and, and especially on Mystical One, and That's the Way It Goes. I love the light feel of Gontrapo. I love the instrumental of Greece, mm-hmm. although I wish I knew all the words that he sang in, in the song, and it was never in the, um, the liner notes, and you can't find it anywhere, although I've never seen the songbook, I should admit, for Gontrapo. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, Unknown Delight is a gorgeous song, great ballad. In fact, the, the guitar solo in the middle is very much like his guitar solo in something. And um, yeah, I've often wondered if that song was about Danny Harrison, because it kind of, you know, if you, if you listen to the lyrics, kind of makes you think it might be about him, mm. you know? So, yeah, I just think song for song, it's a really good album. And unfortunately, like I said, George did nothing to promote it. And the fact that the record company wasn't really promoting him and radio wasn't really welcoming him all that much. And that's why it got ignored and um, is so completely overlooked in his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty much out of step with what the commercial record industry was doing. Uh, It's it's very, it's got George's accent all over it. You know, his musical accent, the slide guitar, the kind of tunes he wrote. Um, Mm. And also, I mean, I think he said this specifically about Cloud Nine, but it applies to this, too. It's an album of real songs by real people played on real instruments. And that was Mm -hmm. different from what was going on. So, Al. Right. Your comments. Uh, It's funny that Ken mentioned somewhere in England and Beatle fan. As a matter of fact, <laughs> and Alan, you might remember this because you were involved with uh, with the magazine in the in those early years. Mm-hmm. But I did a review of Somewhere in England, which I an album which I did not did not like at the time and have never really warmed up to all that much. But I did a I did a pretty negative review, uh, and that got me in a lot of trouble with the uh, with you know, the Harrison fandom and sort of Beatle fandom in general, because this was at a, in a, at a time when I think fans were had not yet gotten used to negative reviews in Beatles publications. So, uh, so got a lot of flack about that. And so I was really not particularly looking forward to this, to this album, to Gone Tropo. So when I uh, when I got it and listened to it, I was pleasantly surprised. It was just a you know a lovely little just delightful album, um, you know not nearly as as erratic as uh, as somewhere in England, and also not nearly as um, frankly as as crabby as <laughs> some of the songs like Blood from a Clone had been on um, on somewhere in England although to be fair blood from a clone has been uh, has has been proven to be a lot more accurate than I think a lot of us gave mm-hmm. gave George credit for at the time but Contropo uh, was you know as I said much more positive the um, the songs that I particularly liked were in a there were three tracks that are kind of very much vocal group kind of oriented uh that's the way it goes is one of those uh baby don't run away which ken was just speaking of there's another one Mm -hmm. where where his uh, where george's vocal itself is almost is mixed down in the uh in the mix you know so he's really more part of a group and particularly uh, I really love you, which was the biggest surprise on the album to me, because back when I was uh, about 11 years old and and was just starting to listen to rock and roll in the spring of 1961, I remember a record by 
a group called the Stereos, called mm -hmm. I Really Love You, mm -hmm. that I remember hearing on the radio in New York. Uh, it was never a hit. It may have been, it may have had some success in New York. But I figured mm -hmm. I was the only person in the world that knew this song. And here, George Harrison records it on, on this album with basically the same recreating, in effect, the Stereos record mm -hmm. and, and doing it very successfully. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's just a, it's a, a, a totally charming album, I found. Circles. Circles was one of those songs that I think, uh, again, that um, we, we, we tended to not understand at the time. And of course, now in retrospect, it has a, you know a lot more. As Ken was saying, uh, a great deal of wisdom for somebody who was at the time it was released, or not at the time it was released, at the time he wrote it, uh, was basically 25 years old, and uh, mm -hmm. that you know that kind of wisdom is uh, is is pretty remarkable, and it carries, of course, now a poignance that was you know, obviously totally unintended, but it, um, uh, it's it, overall, it's just, uh, it's a, a mystical one is another fine track. Wake up my love. The, uh, the album, uh, the album, mm -hmm. album opener is, uh, is very accessible. Uh, it's just, um, uh, as Ken was saying, uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate that a George did no promotion for it whatsoever. And that radio perhaps burned, you know, burned from the, the experience of somewhere in England, uh, didn't really, even FM radio, didn't really warm to that album, didn't really warm to Gon Tropo in, in the way that, um, uh, that it had with previous albums of George's. Uh, and in fact, it, it didn't even it didn't even make the, the national the, in America. It didn't even make Billboard's uh, hop, uh, top 100 albums. So no, it did. Right. It did not 108 actually. Right. Yeah, exactly. So so it's a very uh, I feel it's a very underrated uh, album, and it's um, uh, it's uh, it's one of those uh, <laughs> to coin a phrase. Unknown delights in the mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Harrison catalog. Yeah, yeah. You know, Al, you, you mentioned "I Really Love You," mm -hmm. which to me is also different in the sense that um, George's vocals he sings in a higher register and he harmonizes with everybody, but he's not really so much the lead exactly. vocalist in the song. Right. And in fact, the verses of the song come from a singer named Bobby King. <laughs> yes, who was really like an R&B and gospel mm -hmm. singer. And uh, I know that he did a lot of work with Ry Cooter, which uh, George is a big fan of right. Ry Cooter, so maybe that's how he entered the picture. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's very different in that regard. It's not like it's a, you know, a, a George Harrison song where he's the main lead vocalist. Right. You know, it's, it's very different in that, in that regard. Mm -hmm. so. and, and much the same with Baby Don't Run Away, where even though he is the lead vocalist, his his vocal is is much closer to the backup singers than than you know way above it. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting to hear that low vocal from Billy Preston yes. throughout the throughout that yeah. song. I thought that was really mm -hmm. unique. Very yeah. much so. I just wanted to read this line from Unknown Delight if mm -hmm. I could, because when I read when I hear this, I I immediately think of Danny says, um, you know, a treasure of the world, a child watching it grow, and with all the love will bring unknown delight. Mm -hmm. So when I hear those words, you know, darkest deep brown eyes I've seen, angel came into my dream. You know, it could be about him. Don't know. We'll have to ask Danny I someday. Think I, I did see somewhere in doing research over the weekend while I was getting re reacquainted with the album that, uh, that I believe that song is about Danny who had been born, unfortunately, I don't have his birth date uh, right at hand, but... I know it. Okay. <laughs> it's August 1st, 1978. Oh, okay. So so depending on when it was written, it's very possible that it was, uh, it was, about, it was about Danny. Mm -hmm. mm. 
It's Danny's birthday is always easy for me to remember because it's the same date as the concert for Bangladesh. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> only seven yeah, years later. Right. So, yeah. I think you know. Um, you mentioned "I Really Love You," and uh, it's it's kind of a a quirky little aside on the album, and it sort of calls to mind the the fact that George's covers, which he has on almost every album, are a little bit unusual for a rock star. You know, he's got yeah. True Love, Cole Porter mm -hmm. um, on Somewhere in England, or a couple of Hoagie Carmichael songs. Uh, then there, right. there, there, there's this, uh, Cloud Nine, Got My Mind Set on You, which was, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think a lot of people knew that song, but um, if I'm not incorrect i think isn't there footage of uh uh in the Maisley's brothers yes films of him buying the, or, or carrying around the james ray album mm -hmm. yeah um and uh you know and even at the at the very end uh there's let's see what was it on um on brainwashed, on brainwashed. yeah there was a i think yeah. it was another hoagie carmichael song wasn't it no, it was Between the Devil and the Deep Blue right, Sea, right, right. which um, was a, uh, was it Harold Arlen, I think, maybe, who right, wrote that? Right. Cab Calloway had a hit with yes, it. Yes, so. yes, right. Harold Arlen, Ted Kohler. Mm -hmm. uh, right. at the credits here. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, it, it's another of the many underrated things about George Harrison, his choice of covers for his yeah. albums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, kind of interesting, and and I think, and not only that, yeah, yeah but it, we've talked about when we discussed Dark Horse, the album, mm -hmm. but Bye Bye Love, mm -hmm. which is by you know by far and away a classic rock song from the fifties, he did a completely different spin on right. it, right? So, <laughs> you know. right. Um, the one thing that's a puzzle to me about this album are uh, the liner notes about cement mixing. Anyone have any idea yeah, what that I, is about? No. No? No. Just a joke? Probably. Mm. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Almost, well, What's he that? He was a gardener. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I imagine he knew how to mix cement, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, it, maybe it's in in the spirit of you know, uh, keep it in a cool, dry place. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe dealing with what's around. Um, but yeah, this is yeah. spun out quite long. This 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 liner note here. This album has been mm. a cement mix. It says. So, anything else to say about Gun <laughs> <Trump? laughs> Well, actually, the title itself is supposed to be an Australian uh, expression. Mm -hmm which means gone crazy or gone mad. Mm. So, um, but whenever I hear that song, I immediately think of Hawaii or a tropical island and palm trees. Sure. You know, it immediately evokes that. So, you know, it does something very successfully there mm -hmm. in, in, in the lyrics and just the feel of the song. But, um, you know, more and more, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, you know, equating it a little bit with the George Harrison album and that it's just, it's very, it is, like you said, very pleasant, oh. very charming, very laid back, very easy going. It's like hang out with George in his rocking chair playing uh, some either acoustic guitar, slide guitar. You know, it's it's um, just a very relaxing and uh, very enjoyable album. Absolutely. So I guess one of the services that we can perform in this podcast is sort of recalling some things that maybe people either have forgotten about or in a lot of cases probably have never even bothered listening to. So um, go out and pick up Gontrapo and uh, splendid time is guaranteed for all. Except for, <laughs> except for Steve. Steve doesn't like it much. But <laughs> never <laughs> so So um, we also thought we would talk this week about the um, lines of convergence and divergence i guess between the beatles career and elvis because um early january is elvis's birthday is it like 80 81st birthday something? Mm -hmm. yep um yep. and in fact um there's also frank sinatra's birthday was centenary was mm -hmm. quite recently too and mm -hmm. in, a, in a certain way the three of them um have a lot in common and an awful lot not in common so whose idea was the Elvis thing? That's who we should start with. 
Steve? I think Steve. The way I think it was mine. Um, and you know, the, it, what's interesting about Elvis um, and the Beatles was when you compare the atmospheres when the two of them became famous. Obviously, in the fifties, when Elvis was a rising star, um, I think there was a lot more scorn, uh, and I think Elvis was looked down upon a lot harsher than the Beatles were. Even though the Beatles, the Beatles' acceptance did not come easy. I think Elvis kind of paved the way for that a little bit and made and, and at least helped, you know, helped uh, the Beatles uh, rise to su- success a little bit. But what's interesting is the, the differences between the two, you know, how I mean, Elvis was this real hard, sexy guy where the Beatles were were, you know, after they had come out of the cavern and they had gone to suits, they were very. um you know, uh, 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 Brian wanted them to have family appeal, and they did. And um, so, I mean, there, you know, there was that kind of difference. And and the the fact that they actually crossed paths, I actually saw something online that claimed that they never met, and I I, I kind of laughed when I saw that. Um, even though there's been pictures and everything like that, even though there's been no no tapes, but. Um, the fact that they crossed paths uh, in more, more than one, you know, more than one instance when, I mean, Elvis sent the um, the cable to Ed Sullivan the night that they appeared on, on the Ed Sullivan show. And then they, you know, and then they um, then they met in, in Bel Air in Hollywood. And then supposedly, according to various rumors, Elvis, uh, when he met President Nixon, uh, wanted to take down the Beatles because he thought they were... You know they were influencing drug culture, which is hilarious. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, really. Elvis should talk. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, I mean that whole story anyway is just kind of silly. But, yeah. but I mean, you know, they, they, I think there was a healthy respect between the Beatles. At least respected him. I mean, they because, you know, John Lennon has said many times that Elvis, you know, was a big influence on him. So, I mean, there was respect at least from one side and probably from the other. But. Do you think that Elvis really had anything to do with that telegram to the Sullivan show? I, I always assumed that that was just Colonel Parker. Yeah. You know, doing oh, I'm, a, I'm a sure, managerial. I'm, I'm sure it was. I'm sure that was a, you know, that was kind of a show busy thing. And yeah, I, I, I really doubt that. I mean, he may have, I, whether or not he told Elvis about, it, I mean, we've all heard the sleazy stories about Colonel Parker anyway. So it's hard to, you know, it's hard to say what, but I, yeah, I would I would agree that it's probably unlikely that Elvis had a whole lot to do with that telegram, if anything at all. Mm. And I think hmm. the the Beatles' respect for Elvis went only to a point. I mean, John Lennon in in one of his the interviews he gave in 1980 when he sort of reemerged said, you know, everyone kept asking me what I thought about Elvis dying. Elvis died when he went into the army. That's what I thought about Elvis dying. So mm-hmm. yeah, we're talking about 1956, right? Yeah, but that was a. Yeah, I mean, that's a typical. 58. Uh, that's 58. A typical, 58. That's a yeah. typical Lenin Lenin comment. I mean, I, you know, you have to kind of. I don't. I honestly. I mean, I think he he appreciated Elvis's music. You know. Well, yeah, but there's also an appearance they did on Jukebox Jury very early 64. 364 um where they got one of elvis's records and really panned it Mm -hmm. but then again john sang with chuck berry on the mike douglas show and that's the same the same era that's chuck berry right but right (laughs) right but i'm I'm saying it's the same the music of that it's the music he grew up with and i think he had a healthy respect for that music even though i mean he may have dissed elvis at you know on that show and they may have, you know, there may have been instances, instances, but uh, I really think that they had, they had a respect for their roots. I mean, look at, you know, the fact that they played, you know, they did some of that stuff during the let it be sessions. Well, what they, what they really revered was the pre, the pre army Elvis. Elvis. Elvis, Elvis, the rocker. Elvis, the rocker. And they were, and they were, you know, they were vocally unhappy about the the way his career developed during the 60s, oh, where, sure. you know, where, you know, uh, making all of these these crummy movies 
and with the quality of his records d- decreasing with you know with great rapidity uh, as we get into 1963 and 64 and 65 mm-hmm. uh you know etc and uh you know so that actually they were uh, they were echoing the sentiments of a lot of uh, of a lot of his uh, his you know sort of the the fans of the 50s generation Mm-hmm. You know, because let's face it, uh, John said that, you know, in another interview said nothing mattered really until Elvis. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, right. And Paul McCartney is even was even more of a disciple of Elva of Elvis than uh, than John was. Mm-hmm. And it's funny if you think about the fact that in the middle of when the Beatles, you know, in 68, when the Beatles were um, doing um like the White Album and stuff like that, Elvis went back to uh, Leather and did his comeback special in Burbank. So, Right, right. So. Well, you know, sometimes sometimes I think we have a tendency to dismiss what John said because he changed his mind right. so much. But at the same time, you can also make the point that I think even though he changed his mind a lot, he kind of did feel the way he did in the moment. Mm-hmm. So there has to be some weight put to that. And um, and Paul McCartney has said similar words about, you know, liking Elvis the best before he went into the army. Right. So whenever they did cover Elvis, it usually was the early stuff, although Paul did cover It's Now or Never mm-hmm. during the Russian album sessions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that was their own personal taste. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, and I think Elvis must have liked the Beatles, otherwise he wouldn't have covered Beatles music <laughs> and performed it live. Right. So... You know, Which was mainly you can't just say across mainly something yeah. in yesterday, right? I mean, I'm not sure what more he and, did. And and um, he, and he hey, Jude, hey Jude, yeah, that's true. There might have been a Lady Madonna in there. Not sure. You know, it's it's funny. I I have virtually everything Elvis did, including all of those uh, Follow That Dream series, where they put out all the outtakes of of albums, and I'm I'm partly fascinated by it, and partly it, it's you know. It, I understand what John objected to totally. I mean, there is an awful lot of junk yes. in the Elvis catalog. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I listen to it sometimes with a kind of weird, morbid fascination. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the same – here, here I'll, I'll say something that's bound to be widely unpopular. With Elvis and also Frank Sinatra, who, you know, I, I also love a lot of Frank Sinatra's work and – I love a lot of Elvis's work. I mean, apart mm-hmm. from the stuff I just mentioned, you know, they were incredible singers. But the difference for me between Elvis and Frank Sinatra and the Beatles are that Elvis and Frank Sinatra were just incredibly overdeveloped larynxes. And the Beatles were a group of musicians who wrote incredible music and those two didn't. And the writing of incredible music, to me, puts them several drawers higher in the sort of musical pantheon than Elvis and Frank Sinatra, however great they may have been as interpreters. I would say Elvis, yes, but I think Sinatra had a natural voice. I I disagree with you on Sinatra, including Sinatra in that group, because Um, I I think his voice is, is a lot more... Natural. At least I, th- I, I, I think Elvis's was much more um, embellished. If you want to use that, uh, you know, if you want to make that comparison. But um, by the way, I, um, I looked up online, and Elvis also did get back live. Oh, yeah. mm. So, and I actually mm. have the, have the list here of songs that Beatles, Elvis songs covered by the Beatles, and songs they both did together. You guys want to hear them? Sure. Okay. okay. Uh, the songs that the Elvis songs covered by, by the Beatles are "That's All Right, Mama." You could probably, I'm, I'm sure our, our our listeners already have these down. "I Got a Woman," "I'm Gonna Sit Right Down and Cry Over You," "I Forgot to Remember to Forget." Okay. And the ones they both did together: "Long Tall Sally," "Memphis," "Too Much Monkey Business," and "Johnny Be Good." Okay, but some of those weren't and even then, primarily and this... no, you know, Elvis known for. As Elvis songs, I mean, Long Tall Sally, you think of Little Richard. Little Richard, Richard and, the right. other, and the other three are Chuck Berry songs. Right, right. You know, it just happened that the Beatles and Elvis both recorded them, but so so did everybody else. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. But when but when you're talking yeah. about when you're talking about, you know, that's all right, Mama, I mean that's a very obvious Elvis song. So. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. And then you've got all the solo recordings of Elvis music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Solo Beatles. Right. You've got uh well, you know, you're talking about Long Tall Sally. John performed Blue Suede Shoes, which do you think of it more as Carl Perkins or do you think of it more for Elvis? I I, I, um, I would say Carl Perkins myself, but that's me. Okay. Paul covered All Shook Up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ringo covered um, Don't Be Cruel. Right. Uh, what else? Well, uh, Paul did, although Paul, Elvis, and uh, Wanda Jackson each did Party, which Paul did on the uh, Run Devil Run album. And also, mm-hmm. uh, oh, I'm there. Oh, I know. I know one. one. Just Because. Right. Mm-hmm. Just Because on the Russian album. It was part of the Sun Sessions for Elvis. Mm-hmm. Right. And there is another on Run Devil Run. There's another Elvis cover that I'm blanking out on. <laughs> and there's I also have... All My Trials, too, which was. All right. Well, well, All My Trials was part of, at least when the way Elvis did it, was part of the American, American trilogy. American yeah. trilogy that Mickey Newberry had put together. Because mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's a, you know, a PD song. Elvis, I mean, uh, Paul did I Got Stung on... Uh, That's right. the one, yes. I knew it was one of those that came out while he was in the Army. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the one. And that was actually a really good version of I Got Stung, too. So Right. Um, you know. Yeah. You know, in a, in a lot of ways, I agree with Alan's comments, but there, there are still some differences between Frank Sinatra, Elvis, and the Beatles. I mean... Sure. You know, Elvis was the biggest artist of the 50s, just like the Beatles were the biggest artists of the 60s. I think Elvis Presley, uh, and I completely disagree with you on this, Steve, I think he was one of the greatest singers of all time. I really do. He's one of those few artists who I can listen to every day and never get tired of hearing his voice. He had such an incredible mass appeal, and one of the things that makes him unique, and we're living in a time when the term crossover artist doesn't mean anything like it used Mm -hmm. to, but he was one of the few artists out there who not only had hits on the pop charts, but it was also on the R&B charts, and he was also on the country right. charts. And then in addition to that, not only did he have one of these voices that was so flexible that, you know, they could, it fit very well in these formats, but he did gospel music. Mm-hmm. He did How Great Thou Art. He had one of the greatest voices ever. Oh, I'm not going to um, – I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that if you're talking about – I mean, Alan was making a point that – in uh, natural voices, the Beatles had it over Elvis and and. I wasn't really Sinatra. saying that. I I, 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 it's not really what I meant. I, what right. I said but, was what, that, what did that, it, what, Go ahead. What I was saying was that those guys are interpreters, just incredible interpreters, but really just interpreters. I mean, I know Elvis has some songwriting credits, and and Sinatra may even have a couple here mm-hmm. and there. Yeah. I, I would. I, I think the Elvis songwriting credits may have been. Um, May have been a little bit of uh, Colonel Parker's doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. <laughs> but the difference between the, the difference I was pointing out between the Beatles, Elvis and Sinatra were that the Beatles wasn't really about their singing. It was about the fact that they were actually creative in a non-interpretive way. I mean, there are people who say that interpretation is creative and in, in a way it, it, it certainly is. But there's a different level of creativity if you're sort of making a song from nothing than uh, if you are taking someone's song and interpreting it. I think you have to, I, I think after having watched the um, All or Nothing at All uh, documentary recently, he was, so I'm not trying to, to go, you know, full head here and trying to knock over what you said, but Sinatra and, and for example, Nelson Riddle, worked on those arrangements for the songs that Sinatra sang and and a lot of that recording studio stuff was Sinatra's doing. So mm-hmm. I think I think you know there there may I think there were differences because of the time, you know, because of of the eras. I think that's, you know. So uh I think I don't know, maybe maybe you can argue that that let was true it, for a lot of it, it, <laughs> let me put it in a different way. Okay. But it's a more <laughs> supreme creative act writing something or singing a great version okay. of something. All right, all right, all right. Uh, by something, I'm George Harrison something, not just right. the right. word right. something. Okay. 
All right. No, I, that, I, well, you know, I, go ahead. I think amongst all of us, we'll all agree that we think the Beatles were the best of them all. But I do think it is a very unique talent and an underrated talent to be a great interpreter as a singer and to have a style that is uniquely your mm-hmm. own. And Frank Sinatra developed one. He was so great at phrasing. Mm-hmm. That's what made a lot of his music so different is the way that he sang his exactly. song. You could sing a song great, but what he put into it, the emotion that he put into right. it. When other artists are trying to copy what you're doing, and just like a lot of people tried to copy Elvis and copy the Beatles, mm-hmm. but with the Beatles, their influence goes far beyond just vocals, it's songwriting, it's production, it's all that. Mm-hmm. You've got that whole package. With Elvis, and, and really we're selling both Elvis and Frank Sinatra short, because to me, Frank Sinatra was also a really good actor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in addition to, he was a very good dancer as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Elvis Presley had the ability to act, but he was given right. formula movies yeah. for the most right. part. Mm-hmm. When there were those rare moments when he had a good acting role, like even Love Me Tender, he was mm-hmm. good. But, uh, you know, King Creole or one of those movies, as opposed to all the other ones <laughs> where basically, you know, he gets the girl in the end kind of movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, those were all the same. And there wasn't, you know, it wasn't interesting. It, it was really made for the fans who would go and see anything that Elvis would do. But if he was given better roles, he, his career could have taken a completely different turn. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know. I, I feel bad for the way that John and Paul, and I think George expressed it too, said that you know Elvis was never the same after the Army because I think that in some ways he also developed as as an artist even more, you know, uh, uh, doing a lot of the late '60s going into the '70s stuff, which I know a lot of people think is too Vegasy for some people, but I love a lot of that music. Uh, I love the ballady stuff he does. You know, in the ghetto was an, an amazing song. You know, well, the wonder of you, suspicious minds, all that stuff. I don't think that just his great stuff was in the early part of his well, career. The problem, I think the he, problem is, is that he is that he he wasted. And unfortunately, a lot of this was mandated by Colonel Parker. Um, mm. You know, unfortunately, Elvis wasn't, you know, Elvis didn't do what what in effect John Lennon did, you know, the comment that, um, uh, that John made to Brian, uh, to Brian in the, uh, in the studio, uh, one particular time, uh, when Brian made some suggestions about, uh, you know, during a, a recording session and John said something to the effect of, you know, we'll handle the music, you handle the percentages. If Elvis had stood up to Colonel Parker in that way, his career might've, Take, taken a completely different direction. But unfortunately, he knuckled down to Parker's demands that he make these crummy movies and these, uh, and the, these, these awful soundtrack albums. And so he frittered away uh, most of, you know, most of the 60s. And then finally, after the 68, Come, what's come to be known as the 68 Comeback Special, he did this wonderful album in Memphis, from Elvis in Memphis, mm. then went into the, um, you know, into making personal appearances again at the International Hotel in, in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And, but unfortunately, again, after about a year by 1971, and of course, a lot of this, you know, the the drug intake, the, all the pills and everything, and the increase in weight and all that was taking a toll. But by 71, he was already beginning to coast again and and spent much of the rest of his career, you know, up until his death in 77, doing that, just coasting through, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the white suit and thank you very much and, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And. You know, mm-hmm. so the problem is that the the really significant material that he recorded is unfortunately, besides the you know the the stuff that he did before uh, before he went into the army and all the influence he had from from those years, unfortunately, from what he turned out after his release from the army, there's not that much that's really significant. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the biggest mm-hmm. problem. Whereas, you know, obviously the Beatles had a much as a group 
had a much, much shorter career. But, you know, I mean, look at look at what they accomplished in seven years. Mm. Well, I don't know if I necessarily agree with what you had to say about Elvis's music there, because some of my favorite music of Elvis is late 60s going into the 70s, well, yeah, despite his declining yeah, health. In the, you know. From, say, 68 to through 70 into like 71. Uh, yeah, actually, there's, you know, that's that certainly is probably the best period of his, you know, of his post post army years. But then by 71, he's starting to coast already. You know, in terms of his, right, in well, terms of his it, albums, you can take any one of those 50s albums, Elvis Presley, Elvis, Loving You, um, you know, even Elvis's Christmas album, yeah. King Creole. You can listen to those albums start to finish, and mm-hmm. they're just great. And the later albums, you might find, you'll find a track here and there, then you say that, you know, this isn't bad. This is, if I were making an Elvis playlist, I might put this on it. But they're not consistent in that same way. Those early albums are great albums. Exactly. Great rock albums. Yeah. Okay. Although so is the well, first album that he did after he came out of the army, an album called Elvis is back, which mm-hmm. is basically it's all blues and R and B. There are no singles right. from it, or at least no singles are released at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's great. But again, he, you know, because Colonel Parker wanted him to become, you know, more of an all-round entertainer, mm-hmm. and recording "It's Now or Never" and "Surrender," and they were big hits. And so, again, it was mandated that that should be the kind of material he records. Fortunately, the Beatles didn't go. You know, the Beatles stuck. You know, as somebody mentioned earlier, the Beatles stayed on course and and. Uh, I mean, can you imagine if the Beatles had gone that route? Oh, God, the, 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 the thought is just oh, terrible. <laughs> well, first, I, I, I love It's Now or Never. I love the early 60s stuff, too. Little Sister is a great record. I love Surrender. I don't think that those were such horrible well, records. Well, no, I'm not saying they were but horrible, I'm... but he, he could have done so much more. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have done, but unfortunately, because of the, the well, uh, again, the success, Blue Hawaii is really the, the film that really kind of set the template for the rest, almost the rest of the decade, because it was, because that was one of, that was at that point, the biggest money maker of his career. And and mm-hmm. from there on, Colonel Parker mandated. He said he said this is the kind of of movie that people want to see. So this is the kind of movie you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And so it was girls, 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 and follow that dream and kissing cousins and harem scarum right. and double trouble, which is one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> it was you know the the That's one cool. where he supposedly is in England. And it was, you know, it was completely made on a uh, on a, a Hollywood, you know, soundstage. And in fact, Norman Rossington is in the film. Oh, it, really? Yeah. Uh, but it is absolutely dreadful. And they just got worse and worse and worse until finally in 68, around the time of the, you know, the 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 singer special that, you know, he finally began to take some interest in, in the way his career was developing. Hmm. You didn't make- well, I'm just saying in my, in my case, I just want to say that, you know, I understand what you're all saying here, but I followed Elvis's singles mainly. So throughout the seventies, I loved just about everything he put out as a single and not just through 71. So I'm not one of those people who automatically just look at the early period and say that that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he still put out some good singles, early 60s, late 60s, that mid-60s is, is when there really was a drought, I think. But, uh, you know, late 60s, If I Can Dream is oh, another yeah, great song. Absolutely. You know, and I love a lot of the, you know, My Boy from 1973 was an amazing song for me. And, you know, I liked Way Down and, and Moody Blue and those records. So the singles he put out in the 70s were very significant for me. Mm-hmm. I loved it. You know, it wasn't this comparison between that and the 50s for me. I kind of embraced all of it, you know, as far as his hits. I, I, so. I like some of it, too. I mean, I like I love the gospel stuff. I have the the RCA collection with all the gospel stuff. I have uh, I like uh, his version of uh, You Were Always in My Mind. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like that. Um, 
And I actually, I actually don't mind. I, I know the uh, there's probably a lot of people that think the uh, the Las Vegas stuff is is hor- horrible, but I love that satellite recording where they where he does the you know does the full blown with the jumpsuit and everything. I, I I just I really enjoy that. I actually don't particularly care for the com- the comeback special all that much. I do like oh, really. The- Huh. Well, I, I do you're, like I do like satellite stuff. You're right? you're in the minority because I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it seems like I'm in the minority here a lot, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I do I do like that. I mean, I have a I have a fair, fairly good Elvis collection. Uh, the one there was one, and I can't remember the title of it now. There was a bootleg that came out years ago on vinyl from the um, from the Memphis sessions that is absolutely wonderful. There was a whole series of vinyl bootlegs and i cannot remember the label that was absolutely that it was it was as good as the um ultra rare beetle stuff and um uh, there were uh, and this particular one had the memphis stuff on it and i'm trying to remember the song uh i can't remember the song now um there was one song in particular that he did out uh he did over and over and over again it was just really really wonderful but um, yeah, a lot, that, that, a lot of that stuff is probably out officially now on the FTD um, mm, series. If, if right. you're interested in that, they're they're out there. Um, I'm just looking at I have I have a bunch of Elvis playlists on my iTunes, um, and for the one that is one of them is just the albums as they came out, um, and that playlist is 692 songs. <laughs> So he sure did a lot of work. Um, And then if you go to the FTD series, that is 4,267 songs. So that's, you know, all the outtakes, all the extra live stuff, you name it. So there's tons of Elvis out there if you like it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the Vegas stuff and everything, I mean, I, I find it sociologically fascinating, you know. To listen to these concerts and think, you know, for this was in some ways for some audience a really big deal and a very, very polished stage show. To me, it's kind of actually a different Elvis than the Elvis of the stuff that I actually love. Exactly, you know, the, exactly. The mm-hmm. But it, it's interesting. There's some good stuff. There's some not good stuff. Uh, it's It's very strange, the whole Elvis thing, I have to say. You know, I, I understand what the the stuff that Ken likes. Um, you know, those are in a way the cream of the crop of that era for him. But um, and to me, what matters is the records and his voice. Yeah, were just perfect for for what he was doing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't like Vegasy stuff, I can then you just don't like that kind of style. But, you know, yeah. his voice was something really magical. And so was Frank Sinatra, too. They were both tops in their fields. Mm-hmm. But when you've got a voice that appeals to so many different types of people, so many different genres of music, that is something really unique that we should treasure and, and really look up to. It's, it's so rare to have an artist, like I said, with Elvis. He was on the pop charts, the R&B charts, and the country charts. He had a gospel album. He could do just about anything vocally. And, um, you know, his voice matched the music and the arrangements of his songs were wonderful. So, you know, with the Beatles, their influence was far beyond that. So, uh, you know, it wasn't just the singing, because a lot of people love the vocals of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think John was one of the greatest rock and roll voices and Paul's got one of the greatest voices ever. So, you know, the Beatles influence goes into songwriting. It goes into production. It goes into the way that their careers were guided. Mm -hmm. The way that they yeah. went, the fact that they mm-hmm. that they weren't a formula artist, exactly. you know, like you know what what Elvis became with his movies and with his music in the '60s in particular. Mm-hmm. So you know, I don't want to say one's better than the other. They were all the tops, you know, in, in their fields. But uh, Frank and Elvis had an edge over the Beatles in certain things, you know, especially when it comes to acting, because the Beatles were never really actors. No. You know, I think I think John. John probably, to me, had the most natural ability as an actor, hmm. personally. Although I like a lot of Ringo's acting, you know, a lot of it seems forced, you know, and not natural. Mm-hmm. But Elvis and Frank were really good as actors, and that should also they should be given credit for that. Mm-hmm. Elvis could be good as an actor if he was given the right role, like mm-hmm. I said. And by the way, also because I re- I did a 
piece on this in Beatle Fan some years ago. There's a pantheon of of pop music phenomena, and we've been talking about Elvis and and the Beatles and Frank Sinatra, but also you got to throw in Bing Crosby as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Crosby, who was yep. maybe especially when you talk about somebody who was a multi-dimensional superstar, he was probably the most popular entertainer of the first half of the 20th century. Hmm. That's so, right. He doesn't get mentioned enough because Frank kind of overshadows him to a lot well, of people. Well, only because of the fact that his, the, that his career was so long ago, you know, because, I mean, I mean mm. Crosby had ridiculous numbers of hit records in the 30s, but that's a long time ago. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. So, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't remember that. Mm-hmm. And and Frank Frank really started in the forties with Big Band. Uh, so. Thirty well thirty nine. I mean his career spanned uh, okay. spanned uh, just about fifty five years, and Crosby's right. was only uh, only a little less than that. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas Elvis's career was twenty three years, and the Beatles as a group was seven. <laughs> <laughs> but what a seven years! Really? Right. Yeah, and then again, as I like to point out, the Beatles also had success as solo right. artists more than any other band. So that's also something you have to take into account, too. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. But they weren't the phenomena that they were as a group, you know. Culturally. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Musically, we can debate. <laughs> and we right. do weekly. Right. Yes. That's, that we do. <laughs> So, guys, uh, that was a, a fun discussion about a number of things. Gontrapo, Elvis, Frank, uh, the Fabs, of course. And um, that brings another episode of Things We Said Today to a close for this week. Folks out there, if you want to email us, our email address is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. Uh, we've been getting. Lots of great comments, which we'll undoubtedly devote part of a show to soon. Thanks for, for writing and keep that up. Feel free to suggest things. Um, on Twitter, we're at, at symbol things we said fab. Yay, he got it right. <laughs> All right. And uh, in addition to the, uh, the things we said today stuff on the Twitter feed, Steve often puts his stories there which um, are really must reads you got to keep up with that if you want to keep up with the Beatles so until next week uh, for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman and Steve Marinucci I'm Alan Cozen saying see you next time (laughs) 